Go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy to get 20% off your first month of cognitive behavioral therapy with weekly sessions online with a therapist in addition to worksheets, a journal, meditation and yoga videos and unlimited messaging. There's strong evidence that CBT can help people who hoard and accessing therapy online can be affordable and accessible. Find out more and get your discount at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy. Hey there, it's Michelle Norris. I'm host of a podcast called Your Mama's Kitchen. When I travel, I'm usually looking for a way to find a taste of home when I'm not at home. And one of the things I love to do when I am at home is entertain. And Airbnb allows me to do that. When I was in California recently, I rented a house that had a great kitchen. And when we were sitting around the table, we're all thinking, we're in someone else's house. Someone could be in all of our homes as well. If you have a home, but you're not always at home, you have an Airbnb. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. A lot can happen in the next three years. Like a chatbot may be your new best friend. But what won't change? Needing health insurance. United Healthcare tri-term medical plans are available for these changing times. Underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, they offer budget-friendly, flexible coverage for people who are in between jobs or missed open enrollment. The plans last nearly three years in some states, with access to a nationwide network of doctors and hospitals. So for whatever tomorrow brings, United Healthcare tri-term medical plans may be for you. Learn more at UH1.com. Think of all the sleep hacks you've ever heard. You could spend years trying them all, or you could instantly transform your sleep with Bowl & Branch. They make the softest, most breathable bedding you'll ever feel. And it's all 20% off. That's their best sale of the entire season. Millions of sleepers love their buttery soft sheets, airy blankets, cloud-like duvets, and so much more. And you can try all of them for 20% off with promo code BUTTERY20. So hurry to BowlandBranch.com today. That's B-O-L-L and Branch.com. See site for details. Welcome to the Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder podcast. I am drowning in stuff and trying to find a way out. Listen as I explore the issues and delve deep as somebody profoundly affected by hoarding disorder. Find out more, including links to subscribe to the podcast and all my social media at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. Finally, I am not a doctor. I'm just a hoarder doing her best. So do seek professional support if and when you need it. So I am here with Dr. Jan Eppingstall, an Australian therapist who specializes in working with people who hoard. Regular listeners will be very familiar with her dulcet tones. Jan, how are you? (laughs) Oh, great. And that's so kind of you. To say that about my dulcet tones, I think it's a complete fabrication. <laughs> However, it's very pleasant of you to say. <laughs> <laughs> so today we are going to talk about something that comes up a lot when you hear people talking about hoarding, and that is grief and loss, which are very related. Not every loss is grief, but they are very interconnected. And it strikes me that there are two ways that grief and loss can intersect with hoarding. One is that bereavement or loss can act as one of the types of trauma that could spark or intensify hoarding disorder. The other is a phenomenon called grief hoarding, where somebody dies and a loved one takes in all of their stuff. So we're going to first look at grief and loss as a form of trauma that can exacerbate hoarding. So a lot of people, when talking about their own hoarding, mention the loss of somebody significant. How can grief or bereavement lead to somebody hoarding or to somebody's hoarding worsening? Yeah, uh, loss is often raised uh, by clients and people I've worked with as a catalyst for the emergence of hoarding behaviour, particularly saving possessions. But equally, I hear that clients may have had a number of losses close together 
and they find their hoarding behaviours intensify, like they might have lost a parent, then their marriage broke up and a pet dies, you know, all in a short span. Um, and for anyone, these multiple losses would be difficult, you know, that would be a difficult reality, but most people struggle, a majority would find their way through the stages of grief and reach acceptance and kind of use adaptive sort of skills like talking about it or journaling or, you know, just allowing time to heal and seeking help kind of if they felt that they were still grieving after 12 months or so. But people who are vulnerable to hoarding, it's kind of inevitable that they'll use saving and acquiring as one way to kind of manage these acute emotions. It's it's their go-to coping skill, so their coping style. And that's the case for people who hoard before we even look at the meaning of the possessions and our attachment to them. Grief is a normal reaction when we um, lose a loved one. It's kind of like the price of love, isn't it? It's we, we love this entity so much and the depths of that grief is equal to the love. One of the things that is apparently now a disorder, interestingly, uh, complicated grief. So that occurs when the loss kind of can't be integrated and people suffer from like a persistent disturbing sense of disbelief regarding the death and there's often feelings of bitterness and anger and resentment uh, and resistance to accepting the painful reality like the person is gone but I think it was in the last revision of the DSM-5 that they've added this complicated yeah. grief uh, diagnosis. So, I mean, unfortunately, things being in the DSM drive funding for studies. So, at the moment, there isn't a great deal of research on this kind of complicated grief. But the way the person died as well and the involvement of the person in those final moments can kind of lead to a traumatic or complicated grief response. So, it depends a lot on all of these factors. And of course, it depends on who the person was. Like losing a child is understood to be horrendous. Uh, That's a horrendous loss, no questions asked, right? But the loss of an attachment figure, regardless of how old you are or level of contact, you know, whether you're estranged or not, it doesn't really matter. It's complicated and conflicting emotions kind of pop up. So the attachment figure could be a parent but it could also be an older sibling who acted in a parental role or a spouse who was your parent or a grandparent someone who was that person that safe person um and that's really uh part of what can make it super complicated particularly with people with vulnerabilities around hoarding i lost somebody to suicide and that is a particular it felt very much like there was the grief at the loss of a, you know, a young person who was no, you know, the normal grief. And then there was additional grief at the way in which that person died. Yes. And that's, and that is so hard because it's like, it's additional, isn't it? As you say, it's like that person's life was cut short and I didn't have a chance to tell that person how wonderful they were and how much, you know, I love them. So it's an additional, it's a feeling of, you know, it can be an angry making feeling, you know, that person took their life, but I, I love them. And now I no longer have them. It's like a really, it is a complicated situation or if someone died violently or whatever, you know, I was kind of exasperated at the time Mm. more than angry. I, I, I totally get why some people have an angry reaction. I was more like, ah, goodness sake this could have been different um yeah you know and of course you go what did what did I miss what did I there's all of that and and yeah if somebody dies violently if somebody dies just criminally young you know and they should have had more time or there's so many ways it can be I remember having one bereavement of somebody I adored adored but she was 90 when she died. And I remember feeling like this is terribly sad. I am so mm. devastated. 
but it's not tragic. And it was my first death in a while that wasn't tragic. And I noticed that much as that person was somebody genuinely one of my favorite people in the world, it was a simpler grief to get through because there wasn't additional stuff like, she was so young or she died horribly or anything like that to deal with. It was quite straightforward. Yes. And, and that, and it's, it is, it's about who it is, the way, you know, the way in which they've passed, the way you related to them, all of those things can just make, you know, adds into the complication of how you feel about this person's passing, I think. Um, and you, I don't, you, you may or may not know that research indicates the emotional, that emotional and physical pain are treated the same way in the brain. So we actually feel this visceral reaction when we encounter grief. It's almost like a sharp pain in the heart or it might be like a breathlessness or it really is a physical thing too. And people, you might feel winded or just completely, yeah. you know, um, completely, as you said, almost exasperated in a way if it's something that feels unfair to you. They've taken their life and that seems unfair because, yeah. you you know, you weren't given the opportunity to try and help or whatever. But I've also had clients explain that before a loss or a series of losses, they were the opposite of a, of a hoarder in inverted commas. I've you know, heard they were, this, yeah. yeah, yeah, they were a person who scrubbed carpets with a toothbrush obsessively and you know were clean and ordered and everything and then this major loss came on came upon them and they ended up at the opposite end of the spectrum but I kind of explained to them that this is another form of control so one end is keeping everything neat in at an obsessional level and the other end is keeping everything (laughs) literally and controlling (laughs) all (laughs) you know yeah you just want to avoid feeling the loss of anything. So it's the flip side of the same coin, really. Uh, but I've heard that a few times and it interests me. And I think it is that it's the same, just at the opposite end of the spectrum. Yeah. yeah. The other thing I wanted to mention as well in re- relation to to hoarding behaviours kind of exacerbate or ramping up when someone passes, it could be simply the lack of the person's presence in the home can lead to kind of a reduction in pressure. You know, there's no boundaries, no more direction. I think I see it happens often with um, men in my experience, like their partner dies and the grief kind of leads to low mood and loneliness, lack of motivation. And they don't often have the skills if they're an older man they might not have the skills to manage those simple things and no one's there telling them you know do this now do that now they probably quite liked having someone there telling them and now that's no longer there and unfortunately they slip you know slowly but sort of um into hoarding and sometimes unfortunately squalor because they don't have those skills and they can't reach out to ask for help or, you know, we all know that men don't like to ask for help. So if there's any men out there listening, we're here, we're here. Two things come to mind when you're talking. One is before we started recording, Jan and I were talking about glass jars and um, (laughs) keeping glass jars and having somebody in the house saying, why on earth have you got so many glass jars? And if, if the person who says that dies you might think I could keep all of the glass jars now. Exactly. (laughs) And the other thing is, even just on a very practical level, if you get very depressed in your grief, you just don't have to get up and go to sort the stuff around you out, do you? No, you have lost that motivation, that energy. You really are, you know, (laughs) depressive mood is definitely an element that will play in when you when you're feeling um when you're feeling grief and it can get away from you pretty quickly it doesn't take long for things to sort of slip and that can be very demoralizing and then it's just this downward spiral i guess and then you don't know where to start and so you don't start and it gets so worse and worse start and worse and it gets worse yeah. exactly yeah and it's and that's that's the really heart-wrenching thing because a person might be starting to come out of their grief but then they're 
<laughs> then they look around and realise how much work they've got to do in order to be able to function again and they can slip back down into um, into depression again yeah. because of the state of the home. So, uh, yes, there's a, a bit of a combination of things happening there. Is this similar to the way other forms of trauma can affect hoarding? This was interesting because I don't really have a clear answer purely because there's little to go on other than kind of anecdotal evidence. But one of the things we know is that being with others regulates our nervous system. So connecting is like this biologically hardwired uh, state and we're constantly sending and searching for signals of safety and danger. So if this person that's passed away or distanced themselves from us was a safe person who kind of helped us regulate our nervous system, there, you know, that absence of this person might impact our ability to connect with others. So I guess the same result of fight, flight, freeze, flop might occur because of the absence of the person. So yes and no, I guess, is my answer on that one. It's, it's uh, yeah, that, that one got me thinking. I was like, hmm, how, is it different or similar? But I can see that not having that safe person that you, you know, you're co-regulating with can be extremely difficult um, on the person's nervous system and they might have those traumatic responses. And also a lot of people are, really bad at dealing with other people's bereavements and so if you lose somebody you might expect that your friends will rush around you and look after you and it can be quite surprising that some people just avoid you entirely because they don't know Mm -hmm. what to say or they don't want to say the wrong thing which is the last thing you need but um but it happens it's a real thing Yes. And so even if, you know, your regular support people are still around, still alive, they might disappear Mm. out of, out of that awkwardness. Or I have a friend whose dad has just died and I got in touch and kind of said, I'm around. It is awful. I'm not going to pretend it's not awful. I'm not going to tell you you'll be fine because it's awful. But I know from my own experiences, people will People will talk around it sometimes. They won't say the word died. They will do anything but say the word died. And so Mm. your regular support people might still be alive but disappear or they might still be alive but desperate to not talk about the thing you really, really need to talk about. There can be all kinds of separation from your usual support, even if it isn't your support person who's died. Exactly. And that whole concept of, you know, you want to talk about it, but you pretend you don't. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? You play that whole game and you think, oh, I'll pretend that I'm really doing well and then everything will be fine. So the person gets the impression you're doing really well. And so they don't ask. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then you've got no one asking and you haven't had a chance. I think also there's that time frame where you really are in denial or whatever and you know you are oh, this is not happening and you're pretending everything's okay and I think nowadays things move so fast people kind of forget pretty quickly about bereavements and you're you're in it you're thinking about it 24 7 but they're off at work they're off doing things and they've forgotten that you're probably starting to come into some of those more difficult stages and the world expects you to rally round and be fine again. This friend mm. whose dad's just died found out at that point that her work policy was if a parent dies, you get two days of leave. Like, I mean, as it is, all it means is she has to go to the doctor and be signed off by the doctor for a few weeks. But if the world does expect you to be quite fine quite quickly. Yes. And you're not. And it also, (laughs) I heard the other day someone was saying, I think they said that their sister died or an auntie died, but it was someone who was like this, you know, their person. And they said, look, I need to take a few days off. And they said, oh, well, is it a parent? No. Well, you can have one day. (laughs) 
And then she, this person said, well, I need probably a week because this was like, you know, she raised me. This woman was my, like my mum. Oh, oh, well, you can't have any days off. I was like, but w- we need to be, firstly, we need to talk more about death and grief and all of these things and be able to have that discussion about our own passing with, you know, people that we love and how, you know, that might affect them and how, you know, how all of those things might play out. And also we need to be aware that the title of whoever that person who's passed doesn't necessarily matter. If we think people are going to, you know, use it, (laughs) use it nefariously and take time off, well, they're going to do that anyway. They're that type of person, you know. I mean, like seriously, they'll find some other way to get days off. Their grandmother will die fifty times, you know. Yeah. But most people are genuine. Most people, you know, know that they need a week off or two weeks or three weeks. It's very disappointing. I saw a bereavement counsellor years ago um, after my dad died because it got to twelve months. And so many people had said to me, the first year is the worst, that when I hit 12 months and wasn't fine, I thought I was doing it wrong. I was like, if the first year is the worst and the first year is done now, why do I still feel terrible? And saw a bereavement cancer for a while who was brilliant. Because also I'd got to a point where I was worried that my friends were bored of me being mm. sad about my dad and of course they weren't that was me projecting they none of them ever gave me a hint of like oh god here she goes again but having a place where it wasn't even that I had permission to talk about my dad there it was that that was literally why I was there so it, you know I could talk about him as much as I needed to and I didn't see her for that long I saw her for a few months and it was so helpful and Part of that process was realizing that it didn't matter whether other people were fine in two weeks or whether the first year was meant to be the worst, but actually the second year was still terrible. It didn't matter what society said about grief. Mm. What mattered was my experience of it. And it was through bereavement counseling that I could separate off what do I feel compared to what do I think people think I should feel? Should feel <laughs> the <laughs> expectation of how you should react. Yeah. It's always very um, concerning to me when people are giving you advice about how long things will take yeah. and, you know, how, mu- how much you should, f- how bad you should feel and all yeah. those sorts of things. I just think, oh, God, please stop talking. <laughs> just stop talking yeah. now. And then there are people <laughs> who feel like they're not sad enough for society's no. expectations that um that they feel judged because they're not crying all the time or they're not falling apart mm, exactly and we've just got so many rules and none of the rules they counter it like they, they, they cancel one another out oh you're too emotional you're not yeah. an- emotional enough you yeah. to this you do that it's just oh it's frustrating i think um, and I think it's just because we don't talk about it. We yeah. don't have a, a broad enough kind of conversation about death and dying yeah. um, because it's part of life. I mean, it's part of what happens and we try and just pretend it doesn't. And pretending it doesn't means that you can't prepare either for, you know, if you're losing someone and you know that it's that it's happening, you don't have the opportunity to kind of spend the time with that person just being. You're too concerned with, oh, how, what can we do to save their life? Well, yeah. chances are there isn't anything and th- that's the time you need to spend holding their hand or yeah. talking to them or whatever it might be. I think that's really... Yeah, we hide we hide grief, we hide um, loss and death, you know, underneath layers and layers of, um, you know, social norms and how we think other people think we should behave. It's, yeah, it's not, it's not healthy. Yeah. And of course, those social norms vary 
from country to country. country, to country. And so, you know, what's perfectly <laughs> acceptable in China might not be acceptable in Russia, which might not be acceptable in Ethiopia. You know, it's it's <laughs> not even that it's universally accepted. They are completely cultural and <laughs> and they work for some people and not others. Exactly. It's just so incredible that it's still something that's just not no one's comfortable no no one's comfortable kind of trying to let people have the you know have their grief in the way they they want to we we want to put all this all these layers on top and every culture as you say has a completely different way of dealing with it a completely different set of norms and yeah it's it's quite quite frustrating i think yeah so what about other forms of loss? Could something like losing a job or a relationship breakup have the same effect? Yes, I think when it's related to identity, something that defines us as a person that's lost can, you know, really impact our ability to manage our emotions and function. So, you know, definitely a broken relationship can increase hoarding behaviours for a couple of reasons. I mean, as we talked before, the safe person who we co-regulate with is gone. So we need to find ways to regulate our nervous system. And again, no one is around to hold us in check. That person that kind of said, what are you doing with all those jars? <laughs> when are you going to pickle stuff? <laughs> They're not there anymore, you know? Uh, and if there's bitterness around the breakup or there's been financial abuse or any form of coercive control, you know, reactionary saving and acquiring might result because there's no pushback anymore. You know, I can get, I can go out and I can buy what I want now um, and you can't say anything because we're now broken up or, you know, or you've died, I guess. Um, but losing a job or a life role, like, is is equally destabilizing. Like, empty nesters often find it hard to remain in check with respect to accumulation of stuff. And bedrooms get taken over and become storage rooms, and dining rooms become craft rooms, and all that sort of thing. Um, but even further, I've seen those who've lost a job and their hoarding becomes their vocation. So finding and collecting becomes that routine in place of work. So there's this sense of competence in finding treasures, finding, you know, things of value, et cetera. So it's just a different way of being effective as a human. And that can obviously be a problem with with um, increasing in volumes of things in the home. And listening to you there, I'm thinking of people who somebody dies and they were their carer. So you're losing doubly there. You're losing the person, but also the role. If you mm. were your mum's full-time carer for the last 10 years and she dies, or, you, you know, your partners or your kids or, you know, whatever, you're grieving and also you've not got a purpose anymore. Exactly. I had a client exactly like that. She'd been at home caring for her mother and the thing they had together was going out and looking at hard rubbish and collecting things that they thought they could do up or fix or whatever. So that was kind of the thing they did together. Then her mother started to um, need, she had to go to a hospital because she was, her care levels were just mm. uh, too high. So her daughter was kind of left in the home with all of this stuff. She had no job, no, you know, it was really destabilizing. She, she didn't really have any reason to get up in the morning. So again, that layer of depression and lack of motivation and, um, and then mum passes and it's like, oh my God, I was looking after you. You know, this was my sole purpose for 10 years. Yeah. Um, and now everyone just expected, you know, all of the family members expected her to just, you know, pick up and start emptying the house and, you know, getting back into life again. But it's been a 10 year journey with grief and bereavement at the end. It's not easy. That is not going to turn around, um, you know, in a matter of months. That's probably going to be complicated grief and take a long time to sort through. Yeah. One theme that seems to come up a lot around grief, loss and hoarding is self-protection. 
if you lose somebody you love, you might hold on to all kinds of things even harder. Another is if you lose somebody, you want to keep the specific things that remind you of them. What's going on with this kind of thinking? Yeah, the f- I'll take the first part, self-protection and holding on to all kinds of things. I think you spoke previously about the cognitive bias of the endowment effect. Yeah. Well, there's, of course, another part to that, uh, and that's loss aversion. So that's where a real or potential loss is perceived as emotionally more severe than an equivalent gain. So, um, in fact, the pain of losing is twice as powerful as the pleasure of gaining. So this is relevant to people who hoard because they're very, people who hoard are very sensitive to mistakes, failures and risk. So they'd rather avoid loss at all costs. And it seems there's evidence to suggest that this is due to kind of ineffective emotion regulation because Im- emotions are impacting on our ability to make logical decisions. So when we're grieving from a loss, chances are, again, we've lost this person we probably co-regulated with and our emotions might get hijacked by the amygdala and the logical part of the brain is is not connected. So we keep stuff to avoid the loss because it's the path of least resistance. It's kind of like, okay, I'm holding on. I actually think that what this is, is kind of post-rationalization cognitions. Like this is where we make up a reason to explain these behaviors that are a reaction to emotions, not a rational choice. So you kind of go, oh, this, why can't I let this go? And then we give ourselves a story around, well, I've just lost someone. So it must mean why I want to avoid loss in this situation. I think maybe, I mean, I'm not, yeah, I mean, I'm not, um, I, I'm not a hundred percent, but I feel like that could be what it is. But the other point of when you lose some, someone, you want to keep specific things. This stuff is interesting. Like this is all about magical thinking and something I'm pretty fascinated about. So I get to geek out a little bit. So humans, even those who are skeptical, <laughs> And don't believe in woo-woo or engage or, or, or that type of kind of spirituality, if you like. They definitely engage in magical thinking. So anyone who says they, you know, they don't believe in that stuff, well, they do. <laughs> because we seek order and meaning as humans. That's what we do. So there's a cognitive distortion that suggests that objects carry essence. So authentic objects, that's objects that are known to be originals like, say, for example, uh, John Lennon's piano that he used to compose Imagine. It contains a special essence of John Lennon. And we believe that that object has, you know, hidden defining qualities, you know, it's 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 going to change the world like the song did. Um, and this is known as psychological essentialism. And it's based on something called sympathetic magic. So there's two types of sympathetic magic. There's homeopathic or the law of similarity where like produces like. For example, voodoo dolls, you know, you make the likeness of the human that you want to affect. And then there's the law of contagion. So that is in essence once in contact, always in contact. Okay. So this is the type of sympathetic magic that's in play with loved one's possessions, and it's all because of this law of contagion, and it can be positive or negative. So the physical, psychological, moral qualities of the owner can kind of be transmitted through contact with the object. So I guess researchers are kind of thinking that could be due to the idea that contact expresses intimacy. So, you know, when you touch something, there's an intimate contact. Um, And also touch communicates trust and benevolence and cooperative intention and all that kind of stuff. So you feel like that's what's happening. We all kind of fall prey to this. Like we all have this thing where we think that, you know, something owned by, you know, Beyonce, of course that has magical quality. I mean, like, why would you even question (laughs) that? And of course you would pay, you know, $200,000 to, you know, have one of her nail clippings because, you know, once in contact, always in contact, I now have a piece of Beyonce. So all of this stuff 
is that is why we are so obsessed with the possessions of, you know, loved ones, etc. And in fact, if we lose the sense of essence through an illness, psychiatric illness or a brain injury or something, we can actually suffer from a delusion called capgrass, which is where the person thinks that close relatives have been replaced by robots or imposters or whatever, or familiar buildings have been, you know, replaced by exact replicas. Um, because the emotional recognition circuitry in the brain is impacted. So we're not making that emotional connection. So this is kind of all the stuff that we, why we're so attached to possessions (laughs) and particularly possessions that have been owned by someone who's passed, we feel even more strongly about keeping those because we can feel like we are with them when we're touching those things. We can, you know, we're, they are still with us. And, of course, there's a difference between I would really like to have my granddad's glasses because I associate them with him. I look at them and I think fondly of him and it's a beautiful thing. And my granddad once drank a cup of tea out of that mug, therefore I must never get rid of it. Or wash it, <laughs> for example. Yep, yep, exactly. I remember a girl at school went on a date with someone that she really fancied and <laughs> vowed to keep for the rest of her life the paper napkin that he had used when they'd gone <laughs> to like the bowling alley or wherever, they'd, wherever we went in the 90s on dates. And <laughs> Okay, Joanne, can you get in contact <laughs> with us? I strongly suspect she does not have now the paper napkin that Simon wiped his mouth with at the bowling alley in 1993. But that's the, that's the kind of more irrational, and that's a teenage thing, you know. We, but yeah, like you say, like it's not so much a thing now, but it used to be getting autographs, didn't it? If you saw someone famous, you'd get their autograph as if their signature was a part of them or oh you owned a little bit of them now it's yeah. selfies, of course. It, that's the alternative exactly you want to get that selfie with that famous person and i know that um in ireland they'll send you a you know a small vial of uh soil from yeah <laughs> you know from the countryside which means that you know you're some sort of a owner of a little tiny piece of Ireland, stuff like that, you know. And we really, we, we're we just kind of programmed for that. We don't, we can't really not be like that. So I guess it's something we have to work around. You know, we have to accept that it's, that that's what's happening. And I think you wanted to talk a little bit about grief hoarding. Yeah. So the idea, this idea of holding on to a person by holding on to their things is mm. is very much that, isn't it? So what I've done is I've come up with some of the ideas of the thinking that can happen. And then, so if we go through those, and then if you have any others to add at the end, that would be amazing. So the first one is, if I get rid of this thing, it is disrespectful to the person I've lost. Mm, so that's like that magical law of contagion. The possession is an extension of the owner, right? So, yeah, disrespecting object, disrespecting person. It just kind of, that's just how the brain works. Especially if you are a hoarder and you anthropomorphize things, and you already worry that it's disrespectful to throw something away. It just adds <laughs> a layer of complexity, doesn't it? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that is so true. If I get rid of this thing, I will forget the person I've lost. Uh, classic hoarding thoughts, right? I can't rely on my memory because I perceive that it's def- in deficit of some 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 way. Even though testing kind of result results around memory for hoarding, there's not a fundamental deficit in their memory. Um, but if I don't have a visual representation of something connected with this person, then they will be lost to the world because they're not in my visual field and I can't see that object and that therefore maybe they don't exist. You know, maybe they've, they never existed (laughs) almost. When I was having CBT, we were, well, 
she, the, the therapist, was, I was going to say we were discussing the idea of we weren't. She was advocating an idea that I was very much resisting, which was um, <laughs> trying out throwing away a pile of things without going through them. Right? Oh, yes. Oh. And my absolute reasoning for not doing this, or at least the one I was using that particular day, was um, <laughs> that somewhere there is a letter from my grandparents that I really want to find. And I know I still have it. And if I throw away a pile of, it was like a pile of magazines we were talking about without going through to check the letter wasn't in there. And she said, well, you know, what, what is it about the letter? And I told her about there's a particular thing about this particular letter that makes me feel all these amazing things. And I told her about how it made me feel and the memories it evoked and all of this. And she said, you have the, you've just told me those memories. So you have them with or without the letter. You're feeling those things and remembering it without the letter in your hand because you don't know where the letter is. So why do you need the letter to remember and feel those things? And she was right, but I still couldn't separate. I still couldn't take the risk. Yeah, the risk was too high the loss was yeah mm. was was stronger yes exactly you can see, you rationally you can see yeah. yeah i can remember that whole thing yeah that argument yes and yet yeah and yet yeah that's very interesting yes that's very de- that demonstrates it exactly if the person i loved loved this thing i should love this thing Ah, yeah, that's kind of the law of similarity, like producers like. Someone loved this hideous vase and (laughs) I love that person and I must love this vase and put it up on my shelf for the rest of my life and stare at it and think how ugly it is. But then remember how much they loved it. (laughs) Like producers like. This thing has already lost, this is very much the anthropomorphizing thing. This thing has already lost its first owner. It doesn't deserve to lose me too. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we treat something that's not alive as alive. So that's animism. But then an extension of that is anthropomorphism. I don't know if, have you ever done any um, podcasts around that? I haven't. Oh, we perhaps should. We should perhaps add it to our list. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, because it's giving human like qualities to non human entities, of course. Um, and that can be animals and stuff, but people who hoard often anthropomorphize possessions, but we all do it. We all do it. We all see faces where there are no faces. You know, we all see, we, we say the weather's being, you know, uh, naughty today, or we'll say stuff like that. And it's just, it. you give your car a name. My car has a oh, name. Yeah. yeah, my car has a name too. Yeah, Izzy is my car's name. And I love Izzy. So you give it a name so that you, you know, we just do it because that's, the way we relate to things in our lives that's the way we relate to possessions etc and it is isn't specific to hoarding but it is another type of magical thinking so unsurprisingly loneliness and isolation do kind of impact our propensity to anthropomorphize if we're lonely or isolated we're going to do that a lot more and this one also relates people will say to me oh there was one card left on the Christmas display stand there was just one greeting card left and I thought I can't let it sit there alone I have to buy it and take it home with me so it's not lonely and I kind of yeah I get that I, I I can see these I can see how these things come about and then they just continue to kind of grow and grow and grow and if we we let that happen we can feel less lonely but you know, it might stop us from letting other people in to, you know, kind of fill our lives if we've got, you know, every toy that we've ever bought on the bed, you know. Someone on Twitter the other day was saying, unrelated to hoarding, but his, I think it was his girlfriend, always has to buy, if she's buying something, the most like battered one on the shelf. 
because she worries that if she doesn't, it will be left there all on its own. Or like if you're buying potatoes, she has to get the ugly potatoes or the ugly carrots that she worries will feel sad if all, you know, their friends are bought and they're not. And if you think about it, if you read to a small child, every item or like children's TV, cartoons and stuff, it's living fridges and microwaves and planes and cars and if and that's and every animal has like a personality it it might be a train we start life being taught about these things having little personalities exactly and we just continue it on and when we get older and we say it people look at us weirdly (laughs) but really it's pretty much uh you know it's pretty much in our dna to, to to make things um, you know, human like. I had one, I had someone tell me once that that when they strain their pasta and one spaghetti goes down the sink on its own, they have to put another piece of spaghetti down the <laughs> sink so it's got a friend. Oh. And I just thought, oh, that is just, oh, I love it. I love that. It's just so gorgeous. And I can see how it how it comes about. And if you feel like you haven't been loved or you haven't been, you know, regarded in, in, in this way, you're offering that up to something. You're offering it up to everything that you come into, into contact with. Um, it's quite a human it's definitely a human behavior for sure. You know, it's very, very human. Um, and if you watch something like a David Attenborough nature documentary, there's a lot of anthropomorphizing going on to tell us a story to make us care about the animals. So in reality, the tiger is just hungry. But in the story, the tiger's having all these feelings about its babies and about, you know, and and we get fully on board, don't we, when we watch those we things. Do. And we I do. meerkat mana, meerkat exactly. mana, exactly. And <laughs> and like I noticed it because I adore David Attenborough as <gasps> everybody should. And I was watching, it was a kind of typical will the lion catch the gazelle story. And I really noticed that it's all about, if we get the story that the lion is about to starve to death and that gazelle is its last chance at life, then we are willing on the lion. If instead the story is about the happy gazelle living and suddenly there's a nasty lion coming after it then you're rooting for the gazelle and it's the exact same situation but it's all about how the story's told exactly (laughs) exactly and our world is just full of all these stories and marketers use all these stories to tell us what we need to buy how we need to be what you know (laughs) what we need to think and that's exactly is whatever perspective it's amazing. Want flexibility? Take yoga. Want flexibility with your health insurance? Check out United Healthcare Insurance Plans. Underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, they offer flexible, budget friendly medical, dental, and vision coverage that may be right for you. More at uh1.com. Cool fact a crocodile can't stick out its tongue. Also, you can get health insurance for a month or just under a year in some states. United Healthcare short term insurance plans, underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, offer flexible, budget friendly coverage for you. Learn more at uh1.com. Are there any other kind of themes that I might have missed there? I think it did pretty well. One of the ones I came up with. Uh, was if I throw any of these things away, it will be as if that person never existed, which is similar to if I get rid of this, I'll forget the person. But, you know, it's a bit different, isn't it? bit different. It's like possessions of physical evidence that it happened, you know, it was real, the person was real, the relationship was real. Um, and, you know, humans, we want to put our stamp and our mark on the world, don't we? Like cave cavemen with their handprints, and you know, I've I've definitely ca- carved "I was here" <laughs> on the desk at school. You know, Jan was here. We all want to be significant and be remembered, so we want to kind of leave something of ourselves behind. 
Yeah, we have the selfie with the celebrity to prove that we met them. It's not, we can't just these days say, oh, I met Tom Cruise in town. (laughs) You have to have the autograph (laughs) or the selfie to prove it. And I just would like to make a sh- give a shout out to my cousin who was in London recently having her photograph taken by her husband and Gail King, Oprah's best friend, photobombed <laughs> in the background. Love it, love it, love it. Amazing. <laughs> so exactly, you know, and now I have evidence <laughs> that my cousin was photobombed by Gail King. Genius. Yeah, I mean, there's like a social media joke, isn't there? Pics or it didn't happen. Exactly. And we seem to be living living in that world. And so similarly, as you say, a kind of stuff or they didn't exist. It's the same. Yeah. Definitely. Those kinds of thoughts that we've just been looking at will kind of land unpleasantly on top of more wide-ranging hoarding thoughts like what if I need it all of the stuff we've talked about a lot but are there others that could occur with hoarding connected with grief and loss yeah I think it's those main ones it's the you know everything those responsibility control um, memory attachment they all kind of are part of this, but there's a specific ones for that kind of are more more um, central to grief and loss. So really, they are kind of the traditional thoughts, but they just kind of morph a little bit, and they're more powerful because there's something underneath that. There's a there's a real reason, um, and they're the label can be put on. I'm keeping this because there was this person that I adored and they're no longer here. So I have justification for keeping that. I think that's really what's going on. And there's a lot of magical thinking that we all deal with. doesn't matter whether we're hoarders or not. And those things, if we know that's what's happening, we can kind of maybe, as you say, change the story, change the perspective. I have a friend who is an obsessive football fan and he lives his life like last time I had a bacon sandwich for breakfast, my team won. So I've now got to have a bacon sandwich for breakfast every time there's a match. But then he'll have a bacon sandwich and then get the bus and his team will lose. So he goes, okay, so I can't get the bus anymore, but I've got to carry on with the bacon sandwich because, and he's like, he is not, as far as I'm aware, a hoarder or any particular mental health stuff, but he takes it to quite an extreme. But even if it's not that extreme, a lot of people, you know, they'll wear their lucky pants or whatever. We have that magical thinking. It's what you're talking we about. We do, exactly. And we want, and we do it because we want to control our environment. So these things allow us the sense of control, even though there's not. You know, even though his bacon sandwich is not having any impact on the way the team plays, it feels that way to him and he gets some sense of control from it. And that is one of the ones, you know, that's, that's um, you know, one of the big ones, the superstition, superstitious behaviours and and trying to make things, you know, do what we want just basically through our own actions, which we all know doesn't work. but. Many people live their lives that way and they're happy, I guess. I'm not a superstitious person, but I do. I touch wood if I say something that could yes. touch fate, right? And I yes. I know it makes no difference. But what I always think is it's a small thing to do. And if I didn't do it and then things went wrong, I would really regret it. So I will carry on doing it, even though I know it's ridiculous because the risk of something terrible happening is a lot bigger than the hassle of touching than a just piece of finding wood. wood. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And that is what, you know, that's what most people do to just, if they go, well, look, I don't really believe in it, but mm, just, just, just in case, I may as well. You know, it's not that hard to find wood in this room. I'll just quickly touch. And I do exactly that myself. We just think, oh, the risk. Well, 
what's the point of letting, you know, letting that risk happen? We'll just do it and then everyone will feel comfortable and we'll yeah. move on. It's, it, it is fascinating. I swear it is a fascinating topic. This book that I've, I've had it for years, I've had it for a long time, um, The Seven Laws of Magical Thinking Ooh. by Matthew Hudson. Really good. Love his work. That sounds good. I will I will add that to the show notes and probably to my Kindle. Put that in the show notes. Yeah, it's great. It's great. I, I re- was rereading bits of it and I was going, I really need to reread this whole book again because it's fascinating. But, yeah, he's just really talking about the fact that they may be irrational, but they're kind of just part of who we are. And if we don't have them, in some cases, we can have kind of psychiatric problems where we think, you know, we're dead or we think we're, um, we're our family's been taken over by robots or lizard people. And also, you might have somebody who touches wood if they say something that might tempt fate, but then would look at somebody else who salutes a magpie and think, well, they're <laughs> ridiculous. You know, when they they are also just trying to ward off bad luck in a way that they also know is completely ineffectual, but that's their thing. <laughs> And we go, exactly. Well, to the magpie. How old are you? Touch we wood. all do that shit, don't we? Touch wood. It's like, it's, just, it's, it's so funny. It's so funny. I love it. <laughs> and so if somebody is, is hearing this and thinking, yeah, grief sparked this off for me, or grief made this worse for me, or indeed, if they have a house full of their parents' stuff, mm. what? can they do well I kind of um it's a really hard question but if we kind of look at the idea of magical thinking and our sense that possessions carry the essence of the owner this kind of goes both ways so you know if we were just as an example given our mother's hairbrush you know that's fine we're happy you know we're happy to use it if we were (laughs) if we were given a sworn enemy's brush, even disinfected, we often want to toss it out immediately. So that's one thing. It can go both ways. So you might be keeping things that when you think about it, you're not that happy with engaging with the essence of that person. But if we use that example of John Lennon, so what if John's piano and fridge were both up for auction? Which would be more magical? Piano, without question. Oh. Without question, because it represents what we perceive to be John's spirit and personality and essence. So if we then can apply that to our own loved one's possessions, who was this person? What represents their spirit, their personality, their essence most closely? And that will actually talking and asking those questions and kind of relating to those questions, you might be able to sort of get more of a sense and get even closer to that person. Then consider the objects. What will stand the test of time? What out of all these objects is in the best condition? Or, you know, we talked about um, letters that loved ones have written. Keeping every single note the person wrote. Nah. Keeping that letter with their handwriting and, you know, I don't know, maybe they've kissed it with, you know, they've kissed it with their red lipstick or whatever. That, you know, like, wow, that has all all of the things you want to remember about that yeah. person. And is is it in the best condition to be a reminder of the person? So then you've got to, once you've kind of gone through that, there'll be a lot of things that you'll think, really, is this what mum was really about? Is this what dad was really, is this what my partner was really all about? No, there'll be a handful of things that will really be the core of what describes them as a person. And then how can I honour those objects? which includes keeping them in good condition, displaying them so you can kind of interact with them and tell your loved one's life story in a way. And how else might I be able to celebrate my loved one without saving everything? Maybe it's creating a playlist on Spotify with all their favourite music, you know, and listening to that. There's all sorts of other things that we can do that are not possession-focused um, the perfume they wore, you know, um, I don't know. There's just so many things that evoke such strong emotional memories. 
and we can do it for ourselves as well, like challenge ourselves to sort of find out who we are as a person so that before we pass away, <laughs> we might be able to get to the point where we're kind of keeping the things that are the essence of ourselves and trying that eulogy activity. You know, what do you want people to say about you when you're gone? How would you like them to describe you? And then how do your possessions live up to that? How do they support that? But our other senses, not only, you know, touching necessarily and sight, et cetera, but all those other things, you know, music is amazing. Having an awesome playlist, buying the Flowers Weekly that was your mum's favourite, things like that. I just think that's the essence of the person, not, you know, maybe the dress that they were wearing you know, the last time you saw them, which had food dribbled on it or whatever. You know what I mean? You want them, you want to remember them at their very, very best, just who they really deeply were. And you might actually find that you sort of learn even more about them by doing that, by thinking that way, rather than just focusing on the fact that they're gone. I think that's one of the things we do do. We focus on the, the what we don't have rather than what we do. Something that I've talked about on the podcast before is reframing the question as what do I want to keep rather than what do I want to throw away? And I think that applies to this as well. So yes. rather than saying, what do I want to get rid of of grandmas? Mm. Instead, say, what do I want to keep of grandmas? Exactly. I know when my grandparents died, there was a kind of a day when all the family were going to go to the house and take anything they wanted and you know, sort the rest to donate or whatever. And for practicality reasons, I couldn't go. It was, it was, I didn't drive in those days and it was a long way away. And so um, I was just asked, is there anything you want from the house? And when it was asked in that way, there was one thing I wanted that for me summed up my grandparents and that for me, I could look at forever and feel love Whereas if I had gone to the house with a view of we can't we can't throw away all of grand, my grandparents' stuff and had I had a car or a van, let's face it, you know, <laughs> I, I would have come home with a lot of stuff. And even if, I mean, I was lucky in, the, in that I didn't have to physically go and do it. But even just asking yourself that, what do I want? Rather, yeah, before you go in, ideally, um, I want yes. my granddad's glasses. I want my grandma's photo album. I want, you know, whatever it is. And be very clear before you start. Yes. Then when you get to like your 12th bath towel or something, you really don't think I need to keep this to honour the memory of of my grandparents. Of oh, my grandparents. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I love that. I love that idea of, well, what is that one thing? If I could have one thing yeah. that would just encompass that person, what would it be? Like my grandmother used to paint rocks. <laughs> she was very, <laughs> so she made rock pet rocks <laughs> from her and they do evoke some pretty strong memories and even quite funnily um, a friend of mine from Japan that I met when I was eight years old sent me a picture of a pet rock that I gave her that my grandma oh, wow. made for her and I was like oh my god you've kept it all these years isn't yeah. that adorable and that just is you know I the pet rocks just say everything you know, she yeah. was incredibly artistic. You know, she loved gardening so she, and she loved right, painting fairy gardens and stuff on rocks. So that is it. You know, that's it for me. What you were saying about what kind of encompasses this person's essence, I was also thinking it's not just that. It's what encompasses this person's essence to me which may be entirely different to what encompasses that person's essence to your partner or your sister or your child. You know, obviously, my relationship with my dad was very different to my mum's relationship with my dad. And what I associate with my dad, I might think of a particular item as like pure dad. And, 
you know, someone else would look at it and think, oh, did he like that? Like, no, no connection at all. Exactly. We had such a different experience of everyone. Everybody has a different perspective on that person. Exactly. And you can't all have the same perspective. It's just not possible. So the essence to you is a definitely, that's an excellent point. And practicality. I mean, if you're trying to clear a house, that's a big deal for anybody. If you have hoarding tendencies, it's magnified. But there's, I know I hear all the time from people who were already hoarding and now have two of everything because everything from their mum's house is now in their house. They have two kitchen tables. They have eight kitchen table seats instead of four. They have two TVs. They have two. And so it's partly the emotional stuff and it's partly that overwhelm, that kind of, where do I start? What can I do with all of this? I can't even, I've got four sofas now. I can't move. Exactly. And I'm too depressed and I'm down and I can't, how the heck do I you know, to take those actions that I don't, I don't want to take because I'm, you know, I'm in this place. I actually had a talk with someone today and it was a very interesting discussion. Chris, which is not his real name, he contacted me to discuss how to help his dad deal with his grandfather's deceased estate. And Chris has been helping his father, I'll call him John, uh, sort out the grandfather's hoarded possessions. And at the funeral, John said his dad, he's my best, he was my best friend. And he's even since then made a couple of slips where he's referred to his father's funeral as my funeral, you know, at my funeral. So there's clear enmeshment there, you know, and in adulthood, there was an extreme bond that was, um, that grew between John and his dad because relationships had broken up and you know he was living alone and all that sort of stuff now he's seeing notes that his dad's put around the place and it's like oh he feels like his dad's communicating with him he's you know getting all these messages from him from beyond the grave and he's just not coping with the whole idea that this whole home has to has to either merge into his own or be completely uh, let go. And it's taking months, six months, and nothing has really moved. And I totally get it. This is someone that you felt was your best friend who, you know, saved everything that ever came within, you know, 100 metres. And now you are in that position and you are going to have to absorb it or you're going to have to let it go. It's incredibly difficult. It is incredibly difficult. I think people get caught up in that sideboard might be worth something, that chair might be worth something, that stool might be worth something. And you can't, even as a full-time job, you can't sell every item in a home. You just can't. And if you get, say, a house clearance company, they will give you a lot less than things are individually worth but for the peace of mind or even you know some charity shops sell furniture and will come and collect the lot collect it and yeah. you don't get anything for it monetarily but my god it must be a relief it it's a it's a relief it's a sense of you know that the stuff has gone somewhere that is not going to end up yes you know in landfill it's just the scariest thought yeah and I'm you know I I totally understand I'm coming up against that myself you know with my with my mum and I'm like wow imagine what what is going to happen with all of these things what is going to happen and planning ahead and kind of having that idea well okay what we might do is have um, a clearance company or an auction house or something come in and take the majority and then the rest will, so that we've got some plan in place because grief will just muddle everything and you've got multiple people's perspectives on this family member, how they yeah. view them, what they think would be important for this person. That per- So all of that comes into it and it's it's fraught with arguments and, you know, there's always going to be 
someone who's unhappy with what yeah. happens. So, um, and if you're the last person left, well, then there's the pressure of, well, what do I save in terms of the family sort of history and all of that sort of stuff. So I know when I was leaving home at 18, a great aunt had just gone into a care home. And so her house was being cleared. And there was a bit of, oh, you're going to university, you'll need stuff. (laughs) And (laughs) so I got some stuff that I did genuinely use for years and years and years. All my plates and cutlery and pots and pans and all of that were brilliant. But there was also stuff that I never used because it was from the 70s and I was like, you know, a young adult with no interest in whatever it was. And yet I was a bit like, oh, well, it was auntie, whatever her name was. I'd better keep it. And people, somebody else thought I should have it. So I should probably have it. It's weird the the things we attach to it. Whereas had I given those things to a charity shop, somebody would have actually used them who wanted them. Who wanted them. Yeah. It, it, it's unbelievable the the way we just feel this need to like keep things and I know there's things I've come across in my home that I'll look at and I'll think I remember that from 1990 okay oh I've kept it for a long time must be a reason I get that all the time. I don't know what it is, but it's clearly important. (laughs) Clearly it's important because I still have it. And so I think, oh, just be careful, keep it. You know, it's like, why? Oh, my goodness. I have that a lot with power cables. I go, I don't know what this is meant to plug into, but if I throw it away... I'll need to plug it in. (laughs) I'll need to plug it in tomorrow and then I'll be upset. Oh, like a client the other day said, you know how we threw out that single glove the other day, that single rubber glove? Well, I needed it on the weekend to clear out the gutters. How, you know, how incredible is that? I needed that single right glove and I didn't have it. And we just started laughing. We we laughed so hard because... (laughs) It's just a classic hoarding thing. It's just classic. But we all do it. I just want everyone to know you are not alone. (laughs) It's you are not alone. Proportionate thing again, isn't it? It's but like a while ago I tested myself by throwing away something that I use reasonably regularly, but Mm. didn't particularly like. It was an old It was a plastic tub that had had like chocolates in. Someone gave me this tub of chocolates. And what I used the tub for was if I opened like some pita bread or some tortilla wraps or something, I would store them in this tub to keep them fresh, the remainder ones. And so it was useful, but battered and not particularly nice looking and and I thought, I'm going to test myself and throw this away. It's If I desperately regret it, I can buy some more chocolates. That's hardly a punishment. <laughs> um, <laughs> and get another one. But I want to see what it's like to throw something away that I know I do use. use. So I threw it away. And do you know what happened? I next... Next time I opened some pita breads or some tortilla wraps, I found a different container that would hold them. (laughs) That was all that happened. It made me realize that something might have a use, but even that doesn't mean you have to keep it because because there are other things. (laughs) Um, And I don't know, it's hard to explain. It went and it was fine. And then I kind of needed it and I wondered if that would cause regret. And then I looked around and went, that would also do the job. It's actually a bit prettier. I'd rather keep my bread in that. And and all was fine. And it might be that you have 10 items that you all use for one purpose. Mm. 
and you only need one of them. And you can legitimately say, but I use it. But mm. even that isn't enough if you've got plenty of alternatives. Exactly. I think that is that is a huge realisation because we are very adaptable when we give ourselves the chance. We don't need, you know, one something that we only use for one purpose. Yeah. It's just we don't. We used to have a, a posh kitchen shop near me and I loved going in it because they had so many items on sale that did one very specific task. <laughs> and I always found it hilarious. <laughs> like, do, do you need something to get the pit out of a mango? Here's your mango <laughs> yeah, pit. <laughs> or do you need something? And I always, I loved it. Like, it was so <laughs> ridiculous. You need a separate, I and you just go, you can use a spoon, but no, if you're rich or, and um, what's the phrase, more money than sense, then you buy a specific thing to get the mango out, to the pit out of the mango, or to, you know, to slice your omelette or whatever. It's like, it's going to be fine without. And yet, you could see it and go, maybe I do need that. Yeah, they make one. Mm -hmm. So that must mean if they make that, there's demand perhaps my current mango method is really inefficient and i need a better mango method or maybe better... i'm wasting a lot of mango flesh by not yeah. using the mango pitta yeah well that would uh, that would upset a lot of people you're like hang on a minute i could get extra mango for my buck wow you know <laughs> So, yeah, even if it has a purpose, even if your grandma has a perfectly good toaster, if you don't like toaster, if you've already got a toaster, you don't have to have that toaster as well. No, exactly. So, if people want to find you online, where can they do so? Well, they can come to my website if they'd like, stuffology.com.au. They could maybe go to Instagram at stuff underscore ology. Or Twitter, at stuff underscore ology. Where else can they go? Oh, Facebook. They could they could go over there. That's where I'm stuffology consulting because I tried to change my handle and it wouldn't let me. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook is very annoying. Or you can just shoot me an email, jan at stuffology.com.au. And I always say this, but that's because it's always good advice. Sign up to Jan's email list. Yes, well, it's yesterday as we record. It will be last Sundays as this goes out. Was really interesting about whether our perception of objects changes depending on whether that object's in its usual home or if we move it. And it gave me ideas. So mm. do sign up for the emails because they are always good value. Excellent. Thank you for having me. And I say good value as if they cost money and they don't. I mean, <laughs> they, good, don't. <laughs> I mean they offer value. Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for having me once again. Do you have any burning questions you'd love me to answer? I'll get to the top tip in a second. But my first Q&A episode was really popular. So I'm going to be open to questions on a rolling basis. And then when I have enough, I'll make another episode answering them. Contact me on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or plain old email. All the links are on my website at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. Ask me anything and I will do my best to answer it. Now, your top tip. So my top tip this week is... A quote from Caroline Tota of carolinetota.com. I will add the link to the show notes at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. And Caroline says, For items that you are keeping but don't yet have a home, create a homeless shelter. Once you're further along in your decluttering, you'll be able to assign permanent homes to store these items. I quite like that idea as long as it doesn't become a dump place, a doom box, as I talked about a few weeks ago. But yeah, think about having a homeless shelter for your stuff. Okay, thank you for listening, and I will speak to you next week. 
Thank you for listening to the Overcome Compulsive Hoarding podcast. You can find more online at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. You can find me on Twitter at That Hoarder and on Facebook at Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder. To find out more about how you can support this podcast and the overall project, go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk forward slash support and do subscribe to this podcast so you make sure you don't miss any future episodes. I mean, grief is like a normal reaction when we lose, lose a lot. Uh, better, better. Hey, everyone. Craig Robinson here. I want you to check out the Ways to Win podcast brought to you by Ford and the new 2024 Ford F-150 truck. On Ways to Win, Coach Cal and I will discuss leadership lessons we've learned. We know all about the days spent perfecting your craft outside of the limelight and have knowledge to share about how strength, inspiration, encouragement, and adaptability are the key ingredients to drive toward your dreams. And those same ingredients can be found in the new 2024 Ford F-150 truck. So check out my podcast, Ways to Win, and also check out the new 2024 Ford F-150 truck. Learn more at Ford.com. Built Ford tough, built Ford proud.